and we'll start in just a moment. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start the recording and we'll kick things off. Thank you for joining us for the webinar, Adaptive Trail Mobility Equipment and Programming 101. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 235th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. And you'll see a link to the quiz and the survey in the chat box. And you can turn on captions by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And of course, if another language is ever needed, please just let us know. And attendees will receive a follow-up email from me within two days that will include a link to the recording, the transcript, the resources slide that will include the presenter emails, as well as learning credit details. And I would like to thank the partners of today's webinar that include Visit Long Beach Peninsula, the Professional Trail Builders Association, iZone Imaging, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. And I am happy to introduce our presenters for today. We have Tish Skolnick, who is the co-founder and CEO of GRIT. And we also have April Wolf, Therapeutic Recreation Specialist with the City of Reno, Nevada. So I'm excited to pass controls over to Tish to get started. All right, here we go. Um, hi, everybody. April and I are really excited to spend the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour with you um, talking about one of our favorite topics, adaptive trail mobility equipment, um, all the things you need to know for adaptive hiking. Um, and we'll also talk a bit about adaptive mountain biking. So quickly, before we get into the meat of our presentation here, we want to get to know you, our audience. Um, and we'd like to know, does your facility offer any adaptive equipment or programming? Um, so the poll is going to pop up for you. Um, do you offer any adaptive equipment or programming? Yes, no, uh, maybe you're not sure uh, if your organization does, or we plan to. Uh, maybe this is something that's top of mind for you that you're working on right now. So uh, go ahead and punch in your answer so we can get a sense here. Um, whether you're very familiar with this topic or brand new to it, we hope that we're going to have information here that will be valuable across that spectrum. Um, but this just helps us get to know who's in the audience and helps you get to know your fellow audience members as well. So just wait a couple more seconds here. Let some more answers roll in. Do you offer any adaptive equipment or programming? Maybe you don't, maybe you don't know yet. Maybe you do. <laughs> okay, so we've got some poll results in here. Uh, so really interesting, very split across all the different uh, possible answers. About a third of you do uh, offer some adaptive equipment and programming. A third of you do not. Uh, about 15% are not yet sure and a quarter are planning to. Um, so Thank you very much everybody for popping in those answers. And like I said, we're gonna have something for all of you. So here we go. <laughs> uh, real quick, just so you know what's ahead of you, we're gonna share a little bit about ourselves and the organizations that we work with. We're gonna talk about the importance of adaptive recreation. We're gonna get deep into types of equipment um, covering chairs and bikes. We're going to talk about ADA and trail access, um, typically a lot of questions around this topic. We're going to share some examples of programs around the country that are implementing adaptive programming. And then last but not least, we've got some really great funding sources um, that hopefully will help those of you that are still considering this um, help make it a reality. So a couple learning outcomes. We're going to learn about, again, different equipment options. Uh, the rights under the ADA for trail access and some possible funding sources to purchase that equipment. All right, let's meet April. 
All right, so my name is April Wolf. I'm the Therapeutic Recreation Specialist for City of Reno. Um, I have a background in a Bachelor of Health Science. Um, I'm actually originally from London, Ontario, Canada, um, and then got my degree in recreation therapy. Uh, came to the City of Reno in 2006. Um, and when I joined the City of Reno, the focus was really on inclu you know, inclusion and making sure our traditional parks and recreation programs were accessible to persons with disabilities. Um, since then, in 2008, we really uh, launched our adaptive recreation programming, um, everything from wheelchair sports to adaptive cycling to veteran programs, um, and I've now been with the city for the past 17 years. Uh, I also serve as the staff liaison for our Reno Access Advisory Committee, so really looking at accessibility from a citywide standpoint, um, so not just in parks and recreation, and I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about our programs and what we offer. Um, so we're just going to kick off a short video about our program here at City of Reno. Hello, it's time for the Reno Minute. I'm Chris Payne. We're here this week with the City of Reno to discuss the Adaptive and Inclusion programs. April, a lot of people don't know about this program. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, so the City of Reno offers a number of adaptive recreation programs, including our wheelchair sports of wheelchair basketball and wheelchair rugby. We recently partnered with Reno Ice to start a sled hockey program. We also offer a variety of veteran programs, including our veteran fitness program, our cycling program, and our military sports camp. And all this equipment here in the background, we rent through our adaptive equipment rental program. Wow, so much incredible information. Where can people find more information? Yeah, they can visit the website at reno.gov slash adaptive, pick up one of our newsletters, Letters or visit us on Facebook or Instagram at Reno.Adaptive. Good to know, April. Thank you so much. And don't forget to follow the City of Reno on all of your favorite social media platforms. So now you know with Reno. I'm Chris Payne for the Reno Minute. So now that you know a little bit more about April, i um, love to tell you a little bit more about myself and about GRIT. Um, which is a company that got started out of a class project that I was working on when I was an undergrad at MIT. Um, so I, I actually took a small seminar called Wheelchair Design for Developing Countries, where we learned about basic engineering principles through how wheelchairs are built, manufactured, um, and unfortunately, how they typically break, especially under pretty extreme conditions. Um, so I was uh, had the opportunity to spend some time working with wheelchair manufacturers and uh, NGOs that work with people with disabilities, primarily in East Africa, in Kenya, and Tanzania, and Uganda, uh, and ended up working with a couple of my classmates and the instructor of the class uh, on a design for what has become um, the Grip Freedom Chair. Um, so just on the right there, a couple of photos of us testing products in the lab, um, testing products overseas. Uh, and ultimately, um, we ended up launching the Grip Freedom Chair in uh, 2015. Uh, and with my background, I got to spend a lot of time testing the product itself, um, working with wheelchair users, physical therapists, occupational therapists, working with our manufacturing partners um, to bring the product to life. So we're here to talk about adaptive recreation, and we wanted to share a little bit about why we think it's so important. Um, I think, you know, probably most people on this call are, are in the recreation field or somehow connected to trails and the outdoors. And so I think we all know that just generally being outside has these really powerful therapeutic and healing benefits. Um, why adaptive hiking in particular, it's really popular for those that are not drawn to team-based or competitive sports. And when we think about adaptive sports, it's typically basketball, tennis, racing. Those are the most common sports that um, you know, are typically available or that folks are first introduced to. But if that's not what you're drawn to, you're not going to participate. So hiking helps you get outside and also has that opportunity for socialization. Um, and that exercise component is so important because about 37% of people with disabilities report their health as poor compared to only 8% of the general population. Tish, and I'll actually have you go back to the first slide. Um, mm -hmm. So the image of uh, the individual riding adaptive mountain bikes, um, this was kind of a highlight of one of our adaptive mountain bike programs. Uh, this individual is a higher level quadriplegic uh, that came out to one of our um, community bike days um, and wanted to go mountain biking. And actually it was a lot for him to coordinate 
also like pedaling as well as steering and braking. Um, so he actually had us take off the arm cranks for the bike because um, the bike is set up with an e-assist throttle. And he, and this is a downhill, you know, mountain bike type uh, terrain. And he had the most, you could see it on his face. He had the most uh, awesome time of his life, just being able to get out and get on the trails, even if he didn't have to propel the bike himself. Um, so I think at the end of the day, you know, the people we serve and kind of the impact we have going forward is why we do this every day. Absolutely. Um, so just to bring this to life again, um, this is Tyler Rich, and he described his experience since he got his all-terrain wheelchair. It's opened up countless doors. I'm more visible in my community. I can actually talk to people and meet people and go out and do things. So I think often when we think about adaptive sports and adaptive recreation, we're thinking about the physical activity, um, but there's also that socialization um, component as well and that um, community component of being able to do things together. So we're going to get right in here and start talking about different types of equipment, um, covering a whole bunch of categories of all-terrain wheelchairs and adaptive mountain bikes. Um, so the Grit Freedom Chair is the product that, uh, that my team designed. So it's got this lever system that makes it easier to push. Um, it really is built for these types of hiking trails. Um, it's all quick release, so you can disassemble it and fit it in the trunk of a Toyota Corolla if you need to. Um, as it turns out, perhaps the best trailhead is not right out your back door. Um, we, you know, in particular with our origins in the work we were doing in developing countries, really focused on designing for affordability um, and for ease of maintenance. So all the moving parts are bicycle parts, um, off the shelf bike parts that you could get at any bike shop um, as needed. And then we offer it in a range of sizes, including a kid's model as well. So a quick little video here just to give you a sense of how it works in action. So uh, just one more testimonial to share with you. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is Scott and his wife, Jackie, shared with us that he, this is actually from when they went hiking for the first time. We always had to leave him behind and now he joins us. You've given us back our family time, right? So I think, you know, again, when we're thinking about adaptive sports and adaptive recreation, we're thinking about the, you know, the end users who are using this equipment, but it's about so much more than that. It's about the families who are then able to get out and be able to do these activities together. So. Hopefully you understand why we are so passionate about what we do. Um, April is going to take over and talk us through a whole range of other off-road wheelchairs and adaptive mountain bikes. Great. So we just wanted to be able to share, and by no means is this list inclusive of everything that is available out there, um, but just giving you some other ideas of other equipment that you may look at for your programs or your locations or parks. Um, so some other off-road wheelchair options include a freewheel attachment. Um, so that is an attachment that goes onto the foot plate of a wheelchair. So the biggest kind of, uh, you know, issue with everyday wheelchairs is those tiny casters in the front find pretty much every crack and crevice that uh, exists in the community. And that's what unfortunately will dump you out of your wheelchair. Um, so that freewheel attachment allows that similar to the grit where it's putting that one big wheel out front and lifting up those small wheels um, to get them out of the way so that you can move about on uneven terrain. 
Um, pictured um, with our little friend Cohen is the Hippocamp beach wheelchair. Um, kind of obviously he's using it in a hiking environment, but is really designed to be able to go into the water. And so if somebody wanted to go through sand and then be able to go directly into the water, they can do that with this particular piece of equipment. Um, Freedom Tracks is a really neat um, piece of equipment that allows you to turn your manual wheelchair into like a tank. So you roll up your wheelchair onto these tank tracks and then now uh, you have a power joystick to be able to access, um, you know, more terrain, but with the assistance of that power. Uh, there's things like the action track chair. So some of the national parks and various state parks have started to put those in place. Um, so that would be someone transferring into what would be more like a power chair with tank tracks. There's other wheelchair attachments such as the Firefly that allow, again, lifting up those front casters and then now adding a power uh, component for a power assist to be able to access um, various off-road terrain. So I'm just gonna show a quick little video, just giving an overview of adaptive mountain bikes. Um, and then we'll discuss each of the categories that are available. is a unique city of Reno facility. We actually own a ski hill that we um, lease out to um, Sky Tavern, which is a nonprofit. Um, previously, Sky Tavern's focus was on winter sports and um, not teaching kids how to ski. Uh, they also have an adaptive ski program at that location. Um, and then in the past several years where mountain biking has become extremely popular, um, we've been able to do a lot of trail building, you know, in the summer and make the facility available year round. Um, so with that trail building, we've been able to put a number of universally accessible trails in, uh, in partnering with the High Fives Foundation that was uh, featured in that film um, to make sure that the trails that are going in there work for everyone. Um, so we're going to go into a little bit of the equipment. Um, so the first category is off-road uprights and recumbents. Um, so e-bikes, there's a lot around e-bikes um, and where they belong and where they're a good fit. Um, but e-bikes really opened up, um, you know, accessibility to mountain biking for individuals with disabilities. So whether they're an amputee or they have an incomplete spinal cord injury, um, e-bikes have definitely, you know, made the sport of mountain biking accessible to individuals with disabilities. Um, so often, if you're an avid uh, mountain biker, the e-bikes might be a, a touchy subject, but it really has open up the sport to a, a large category of individuals. Um, and then recumbent. So sometimes balance is an issue if somebody has had a stroke or maybe a traumatic brain injury um, where riding on two wheels is maybe not feasible or safe. Um, so there's a number of options for three-wheeled um, mountain bikes. So the ice full fat is one of my favorite in our program. It has super wide tires. I call it the giggle maker because it bounces on all the terrain that we go on. Um, it's super fun, but super stable um, for anybody riding the trails. Um, similar bikes would be um, the HP as well as the reactive adaptation Stinger. Um, the Azub is a brand new recumbent trike that came out. And again, this list is not inclusive of probably everything that uh, is out there or being engineered um, in this very moment. So. So off-road hand cycles. Um, so there's a number of options for hand cycle power. So arm-powered bikes, 
Um, so the one-off hand cycle was kind of the originator of adaptive mountain biking. Um, you actually don't see a lot of them out there anymore um, as the, you know, the popularity of adaptive mountain biking and builders have come out. Um, so different uh, other bike options. So the bike um, pictured in the uh, in the photo is the G Trike Explorer. Um, there's also a Reactive Adaptations Bomber. Very similar geometry and setup. Um, so again, you'll see two in the front and one in the back. And the rider is um, actually up on their knees and riding um, so that they're in a more aggressive mountain biking position. Not a great bike for everybody, um, dependent on somebody's fun, uh, you know injury level or flexibility to be able to get your legs behind you. Um, this position is not always the greatest for everybody, but it does put you in a much more aggressive mountain bike uh, stance to be able to do the more technical downhill um, type mountain biking. The G-Trike, Nuke, and Mako are a more upright type adaptive mountain biking. Mountain bike, again, with two wheels in the front and one in the back, but your legs are actually out in front of you and you're sitting in a more upright position. Um, so again, if my husband is a quadriplegic um, who has a higher level spinal cord injury, he's much more comfortable being in that more upright position and being able to control the bike in that way. Um, and then all of these bikes are great in that they have adaptations that you can add to it um, for higher level spinal cord injuries. So things such as our G-trike is set up with an elbow brake so that if somebody is a quadriplegic and needs to keep their hands affixed to the bike, they can still be able to control the brake as well as some are even set up with chin and elbow shifters. Um, so that there's a number of various modifications that can be made to these bikes to make them usable by anybody. Um, the next type of bike, is now the Lasher Madeline Arogue. Um, this bike has one wheel in the front. So now your drive wheel is the front wheel and two wheels in the back. There's some advantages. Some people, again, like that positioning better than being in the more aggressive mountain bike positioning. However, with that drive wheel in the front, anything that it starts to get super steep um, then becomes a little bit more challenging because you don't have as much weight over that drive wheel as if you do with the rear um, drive wheel. And again, like I mentioned, this doesn't even encapsulate everything that is available. There's actually a really neat um, individual actually trying to build a hand cycle that he's gonna hand over all of his specs. He's out of Ireland um, so that you can kind of build your own. And so he's doing an open source uh, adaptive mountain bike. So there's so many uh, engineers out there trying to kind of create something that is going to work for them personally or for others with disabilities. So the next category I call off-road off hand cycles extreme. Um, so I think you saw some of the photos in um, and video uh, of the bowhead. Um, so bowhead has kind of changed the game as far as um, adaptive mountain biking. Um, they're based out of Canada. Um, their bike is featured in this picture. Um, they went to an articulating design that really kind of opened up uh, adaptive mountain biking. That allowed the bike to be much narrower than all of the other bikes that are available on the market. That articulation really more mimics true to traditional two-wheel mountain biking. Um, so being able to articulate and come through berm turns um, gives this bike so much more access and being narrower, you know, things, concerns such as bridge widths or crossings um, kind of are eliminated by that narrower design of the bike. They are a full power bike. So some of them, uh, the Rogue is especially has uh, no pedal assist. It is all throttle. Um, you know, for our program being a city program, there's such a learning curve with this type of bike that we don't make the, the Rogue available in our rental program, uh, but we would use it in our clinics and workshops. Um, Outrider has a very similar, they're actually a four-wheeled bike, again, um, all power, and then also an assist option as well. Um, and again, there's other bikes that exist out there that we have probably not mentioned, um, but just giving you a taste of what is available. So we're going to talk a little bit briefly on ADA and trail access. So just generally the rights under the ADA. Um, so there's under Title II for us as a city and uh, entity, there's the right to the most integrated setting. So if you're providing a program 
Um, it needs to be in an accessible location that everybody can access. Uh, the right to participate. So if I if I have a disability and I pay my registration fee like everybody else, I should have the right to participate in that program. And then the right to reasonable accommodation. So if there's anything, modifications that need to be made to the program, um, those are some of the rights that are under the ADA. So trail access. Um, definitely my eyes have been opened as far as trail access and kind of working in this realm. Um, so at the bottom, you'll see an adaptive mountain bike trail rating system. Uh, so Jeremy McGee has, has was working with trail forks um, to try to create a rating system for adaptive mountain biking, uh, similar to what you would see if you headed to a ski area and you were picking that green, blue, or black run. Um, so the, with that system, he was trying to look at a ATM at B level one where the, the rider potentially didn't need any um, assistance and they could ride uh, independently without any support. AMTB2 obstacles exist and you might need a support rider in some locations. And then AMTB3 where a sport rider would be needed for most of the ride. Um, really kind of the opinion of individuals that are riding these bikes and have disabilities is really that system is a little subjective um, with you know, particular disabilities or the types of equipment that is available. Um, what I might think is a green might be a black to someone else or vice versa. Um, so really it's more important to provide really objective information about your trails versus giving it a particular rating of being uh, a universally accessible or a certain ACBMB color um, because it's really up to the user as to whether they think they are capable of riding that trail based on the cross slope, um, maybe the width of the trail, if there's an obstacle and the width, width of the, that obstacle. So it's more important to provide that really objective trail information and let the end user then make their decision as to whether it's accessible for them or not. Um, so things to consider too is not just the trail, but all the trail amenities as well. So do you have an accessible parking lot to be able to park with ADA parking? Are the restrooms that you have available at that um, trailhead accessible? Is there gates that you're using to block out having, you know, UTVs or other um, you know, vehicles accessing the trail? Does it allow for an adaptive mountain bike to be able to navigate through that space? Um, so maybe going beyond just your trail design is also looking at your trail amenities and making sure that it's accessible. And then I talked a little bit about the signage and information. There's really great examples of, so Washoe County Parks here in Nevada has done a really great job of, you know, really spelling out that objective trail information that allows the end user to pick whether it's accessible to them or not. So briefly, we'll go over the ADA. So um, it's really important to kind of understand the definition of a wheelchair. Um, so like a manual wheelchair or a power wheelchair or an off-road wheelchair. Um, so just understanding the definition of a wheelchair will help you understand the access that then these pieces of adaptive equipment have access in the trail systems. So models meeting wheelchair definitions are their legs for walking and in non-wilderness areas, these same devices are also used as bikes. So federally des des designated wilderness area per the ADA is Congress reaffirms that nothing in the Wilderness Act prohibits wheelchair use in a wilderness area by an individual whose disability requires it. So the definition devices designed solely for the use by a mobility impaired person for locomotion that is suitable in an indoor space. So we're gonna break down that um, definition to see how that applies to our adaptive equipment that we're looking at. So the first part of the definition of use of a wheelchair is designated so solely for the use by a mobility impaired person for locomotion. So if you were to go onto a website for any of these pieces of equipment, be it the Grit Freedom Chair, or if you're on Bowhead's website or Reactive Adaptations website, you will find throughout their website that it specifies that this equipment is for persons with disabilities. So under this kind of yes or no question, is this equipment intended for a mobility impaired person? The answer would be yes. So we're gonna move on to the next piece of that definition. So next, oh, 
It says so suitable for use in an indoor pedestrian area. So we want to take a look at some days I might come to work and maybe I wear my running shoes for an indoor space, but maybe I'm going hiking. And so I have my hiking shoes, which might be comparable to my mountain bike tires. So we're looking at, you know, the types of wheel, uh, tires that exist on these bikes are similar to the shoes that we might be doing using for different recreation activities. Maybe my slicks if I'm on in a gym or my hiking shoes if I'm going out hiking. So are these um, uh, shoes or tires that I have on our uh, mobility equipment for an indoor pedestrian area? The answer would be yes. And then the next piece of it is, is the device battery powered? So if I have a manual wheelchair, my husband actually has power assist wheels on his um, wheelchair. Or when he first was injured, he was in a power chair. Um, so both of these examples of a wheelchair do have a power assist option. Um, so yes, they have access. So both battery or non-battery powered wheelchairs are allowed anywhere foot travel is allowed in the wilderness. Where the difference is and their access is not allowed is the gas powered options that might be an other power driven mobility device. All right, so we're going to dive in and talk a little bit about some specific programs and what it looks like to actually offer adaptive hiking, adaptive mountain biking, uh, whether you're an adaptive sports organization, a park, a camp, a school. Um, we've been fortunate over the past few years or so to work with a whole range of organizations who are implementing adaptive hiking and just sort of getting into offering all terrain wheelchairs and adaptive mountain bikes. And the one thing we commonly hear is that. You know, this this information is new and it's a lot to add, especially with small teams and small budgets. And so uh, we understand all of that and are certainly keeping that in mind and all the information that we're going to be sharing here. Um, so uh, state parks, um, it's been really interesting over the past few years to see state parks stepping up and offering this equipment. Um, uh, Texas State Parks has been expanding their all-terrain wheelchair program across the state. Uh, Michigan State Parks, um, similarly, has been adding a variety of types of equipment in different locations. Um, in some cases, it's first come, first serve. That's how most of the Texas State Park programs operate, where you can check the device out at the visitor center. Um, some of the Michigan State Parks have experimented with a uh, rental program or a reservation program, I should say, where you communicate with them in advance and let them know which uh, you know day and time you're going to be coming to reserve the equipment. Um, because most of these locations are, you know, they have, you know, one, two, maybe three pieces of equipment. Um, it is important to set those expectations that, you know, equipment is available, whether it's first come, first serve, or it's on an advanced reservation. So you don't have folks showing up kind of disappointed that they were hoping to use equipment that's already been checked out. Uh, in Massachusetts, the Universal Access Program, which is run by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, um, does it a little bit differently. Instead of having the equipment at these designated parks and facilities, um, they keep the equipment in a central location and run programming at the parks throughout the year. Um, so they have a pre-planned schedule of adaptive hiking, kayaking, biking that they publicize, and then uh, folks can sign up and uh, the, the Universal Access Program shows up with the equipment on the designated trail and takes people through a guided experience. So um, that's another really interesting way to implement the programming. If you're gonna, especially you can get a lot of mileage out of just a few pieces of equipment that are moved around to different locations. Uh, Waypoint Adventure is one of the nonprofits that provides the programming um, that the Massachusetts Universal Access Programming offers. Um, so um, they're the ones who, uh, one of the organizations that actually runs the program on the trails. Um, they have some additional uh, equipment that they can offer and also a huge team of volunteers that love to come out and help. Um, so they can do these big group hiking experiences, which um, is you know, a pretty different experience than for some folks, they may want the uh, you know more sort of solo or small family uh, experience of checking out the equipment at a park and just going out um, with their small group. And for other folks, it's about this larger, uh, the, the camaraderie, the group experience of being out on the trail together. 
Now, in some of those earlier examples, that probably sounded like all those organizations were doing all of the work themselves, uh, which certainly can sound daunting. Um, and I think what's actually been really cool, uh, especially in the past few years, is organizations partnering and working together, kind of each bringing their strengths to the table. Um, so in this case, Catalyst Sports, an adaptive sports group um, out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and Great Smoky National Park teamed up. Um, Great Smoky has some equipment. Catalyst Sports has some additional equipment. Of course, Great Smoky has the has the trails um, and the, the park staff that is so knowledgeable about the trails they offer. Uh, the Catalyst Sports is more connected to the adaptive sports community um, because they've been operating and offering adaptive recreation for so long. And so they teamed up last summer and offered a couple of designated adaptive hiking days and an adaptive mountain biking day um, where Great Smoky was able to bring the equipment and, and have the trails available and Catalyst Sports was able to help market it and drive participation. So whether you've got a whole fleet of equipment or you're looking to add some, uh, funding is often the number one question that we get is how am I gonna be able to, to pay for this, to be able to implement it in our community? So there are a variety of things that can be funded. Um, it's not just the equipment. As you start to think about what this programming looks like, you may need personnel. Maybe you already have a visitor center that could easily handle checking out an all-terrain wheelchair. Maybe you don't. Um, maybe that's a volunteer position that needs to be added. Um, sometimes trail work can be funded, the marketing of programming, and then transportation costs to get participants to and from these uh, adaptive hiking and biking events. So we're going to go through a couple different types of funding that we know have been used by organizations to fund their adaptive recreation programs, um, from the internal budget to the city, county, state funds, um, donors, friends of groups, grants, and rental programs. So this list is not exhaustive. These are a, a handful of the most common grants that we have seen being used. Again, not exhaustive. Um, there are a few nationwide foundations, so applicable, any organization nationwide would be eligible to apply. Uh, I'm going to go through these, but the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, the Nielsen Foundation, both of these focus on pe serving people with spinal cord injuries specifically, uh, and then the AARP Community Challenge. There and then are I would add one more too. So if you're serving veterans, so the VA Adaptive Sports Grant is also a great um, federal opportunity um, as far as being able to uh, purchase equipment. But again, you need to make sure that your community or program is serving a veteran population as well. Yes. Um, there are corporate grant opportunities. So Hydro Flask and Bass Pro Shops are just two corporations that we are familiar with that offer grant programs to nonprofits and, and parks and whatnot. Um, there may be local grant programs that you, of course, are going to be more familiar with. And then I also wanted to mention um, a pass-through grant opportunity uh, via Move United. And we will talk a little bit more about Move United at the end, but um, they offer pass-through grants to their uh, member chapters. So if you are a member of Move United, uh, which City of Reno, April's organization is, you are eligible for some of their internal grant opportunities. <clears throat> so to get into a bit more detail, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, theirs is the Quality of Life Grants Program. Grants start at $25,000. Again, it's focused on serving people with paralysis. If you're you know, looking at something like this to purchase equipment, it's not that only people living with paralysis can use the equipment, it's that you need to be able to highlight in your application and in your follow-up reporting um, how that population is being served. The Nielsen Foundation, they have a program called Creating Opportunity and Independence, again, focused on uh, people living with spinal cord injuries. Same thing, other people can use the equipment, um, but you need to highlight in your application how people with spinal cord injuries and, and hopefully be able to at least uh, suggest the number of individuals that will be served. Um, like some of these larger programs, this is a, this is a range um, from 25 to $200,000. Um, and it is a grant process that starts with a letter of intent. So for those of you that are more familiar with grant writing, you're not diving in and writing the entire application all up front. You're starting with that letter of intent, and then you'll be notified if you're invited to submit the full application. 
Um, the AARP Community Challenge is a newer one that we've learned about. These are smaller grants to fund projects that can be implemented um, fairly quickly, and their focus is on making communities more livable. Um, so big range um, here as well, um, but that average kind of, you know, $12,000 could fund, you know, one very high-end adaptive mountain bike or a couple um, all-terrain wheelchairs or some kind of, you know, combination therein. <clears throat> Hydro Flask has a program called Parks for All. Um, they pick 10 states, about 10 states that they focus on each year. Um, they have not yet announced what those 10 states are. So as soon as they do, um, we'll be happy to share that information. Um, but again, it kind of covers that whole range of uh, use cases where you could, some of it could be used for equipment, but also about um, could be used for trail work, um, as well as, you know, anything that's providing more equitable access. So it could include perhaps transportation for people to get to your to your park or to your program to participate. Um, Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's has this outdoor fund. Uh, it's open year round. So unlike those earlier grants I mentioned, while those are much larger, they have a, an annual review process. Um, Bass Pro Shops outdoor fund is open year round. Um, so something to definitely take a look at. And then Move United, which I mentioned. Um, so they're a member organization um, they have their own grant program where basically they've applied for grants and then they're able to distribute them internally to their member organizations uh, and a whole range of uses for how the funding can be used there. Um, so cool that we know that there are a whole bunch of opportunities for grants, but um, people are actually applying for these and getting them and using the money to implement their programs. So um, I think too often these kind of grant opportunities are tossed around and it sounds great, but it seems unlikely that we might get it and it's not worth applying. Um, other organizations are doing this and getting the funding and implementing their program. So that Great Smoky Mountains National Park uh, program that I mentioned, that included a partnership with Catalyst Sports. Um, that was from a specific grant program um, that was also uh, partially linked to the Toyota Mobility Foundation, um, but big grant money coming in to fund that program. Uh, North County Land Trust out of central Massachusetts, they funded their equipment um, through a grant from that Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's Outdoor Fund. Truckee Meadows Parks Foundation, one of April's neighbors, they partially funded some of their equipment through that AARP Community Challenge, uh, one of the first programs in Nevada to be awarded a grant there. And then I wanted to mention Garrett Trails. They've got a grant from the Tucker Community Foundation. It's a small community foundation that you know, we were never going to find and recommend to anybody and you know, likely only applies to folks who live in that community. But these funds exist and are worth looking for. Um, they're looking for you know, organizations in the community that they can help drive change with. Um, and so it's worth thinking hyper-local as well and not only thinking about these big nationwide or corporate opportunities as well. Um, so this is another kind of program example. It also has kind of um, a financial tie to it. So um, one of the things that was mentioned by our program was that, you know, I don't want to, if a person with a disability wants to recreate, they don't want to show up on a certain day at a certain time for a certain fee to be able to recreate. Uh, and that they want to make sure that this equipment is available when they want to use it. Um, so with us kind of, re, you know, getting and accumulating lots of equipment over the years, um, we made our av equipment available to rent. So all of our equipment is available to rent if it's not being utilized for a program. Um, so everything from our beach wheelchairs to our road cycles to our adaptive mountain bikes to wheelchair attachments, all of our equipment is available to rent. Um, it's a nominal fee for individuals to rent, um, and they can rent anywhere from a one-day rental uh, up until a month rental. Um, this is a great opportunity for individuals to kind of try before they buy. Um, as mentioned, a lot of this equipment is really expensive. Um, you know, grit being on the more affordable end, but some of the adaptive mountain bikes are now reaching almost twenty-two to $23,000 just for one piece of equipment. So it's a really great opportunity for individuals to really figure out what's going to work for them and kind of try before they buy. Um, and then we were able to receive a Craig H. Nielsen Foundation grant um, during COVID, which 
everybody wanted to recreate. So I think if you were trying to buy an e-bike, they did not exist <laughs> during COVID. And so what that grant allowed us to do was to make all of our adaptive equipment uh, available for free um, for individuals to rent um, during that time period. And so we are renting it out of the back door of our rec center um, and being able to you know, make sure that recreation was accessible to persons with disabilities during that time. Um, other examples of programs that we run or that you could explore running, um, so an adapt adaptive hiking program, so Tish mentioned kind of more structured programs that might be run by either a parks organization or a nonprofit that serves individuals with disabilities. Um, one-time clinics, so adaptive clinics in order to try things. So we do a number of community bike days uh, kind of throughout the year in partnership with the High Fives Foundation. Um, so it's an opportunity for um, us to have all our bikes available. We actually partner with another nonprofit organization to have even more equipment available. Um, so individuals can try the equipment before um, they purchase or, you know, want to continue in the sport. Adaptive camps. We actually host a adaptive mountain bike camp and camping weekend at Sky Tavern. Um, so a, an opportunity kind of to really more dial in their skills in providing adaptive mountain biking, um, as well as, you know, if you have a new injury, maybe you haven't camped since your injury. So being able to incorporate an overnight as a part of that camp. Um, adaptive competitions. So we actually include a race as a part of our adaptive mountain bike camp and camping weekend. Uh, we go down to Boise and do a partnership with Challenge Athlete Foundation that uh, includes a race. So, you know, there's opportunities for racing as well for adaptive mountain biking. And then offering an adaptive lesson. So Mammoth um, offers a lesson program where they provide adaptive mountain bike lessons. Uh, there's actually training that's available. Um, so a lot of our staff have the BICP adaptive mountain bike level one um, certification. So if you're looking to kind of add some certification before you start into this programming, that's a great idea to kind of add that to your certification so that you know how to provide these programs safely. And then we okay. mentioned Move United. Um, so Move United is a great resource. Um, we became a Move United chapter. Uh, we were actually one of the first municipal organizations that became a chapter. And as Tish mentioned, this really opens you up to a lot of resources as far as training, those pass-through grants, insurance. Um, so there's a number of different benefits. And they also host an annual conference every year um, so that if you're looking to explore more about either um, trail access and accessible um, mountain biking programs or hiking programs, their conference really serves as a great opportunity to learn more. All right, so we saved a little under 15 minutes here for Q&A. Um, there's obviously a lot to cover. and it's, We certainly couldn't be exhaustive with all the funding opportunities and every piece of equipment, but um, we're passionate about adaptive recreation. We work with lots of organizations that are as well. And so um, we're glad that you spent the time with us here. We're excited to answer your questions. And we've also got a uh, sort of part two of this webinar um, coming up in May, um, where we'll have two other organizations that provide um, <clears throat> all-terrain wheelchairs and adaptive trail programming um, joining to speak about their personal experiences. Great. Well, thank you, April and Tish. Really appreciate the presentation. A lot of questions coming in, but of course, if, if there are more questions, I encourage attendees to share that in the Q&A box. And I have the emails up for both presenters if you do wish to follow up with them. And of course, their emails will also be in my resources slide that I will share in my follow-up email. Um, so let's try to get to as many questions as we can before we end. Um, a question from Tiffany asking, um, she's in Canada, asking if the grants, if you guys are aware, um, if they are available for anyone outside the U.S.? Yes. So I'm fairly certain that the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation um, is available to those that are living in Canada for sure. Uh, Tish, do you know of any other ones? Um, I don't know for sure, but that is a great question and we will include that. Yeah, I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure um, Christopher Reeve is. Okay, perfect. And Kathleen has a question um, asking, you know, seeing that are all adaptive trails and or mobility um, ability refer to wheeled mobility. Now, how do the use of crutches or other adaptive walking devices uh, or how are they considered in trail design and programming? Any 
Yeah, no, that, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, so actually, uh, one thing that's been interesting um, in our work at GRIT is that about a, a third to a half of folks who use the GRIT Freedom Chair um, don't use a wheelchair full time. They might use a cane or crutches or a walker to get around indoors or for, you know, not trail like outdoor settings. Um, but then they're switching to an all terrain wheelchair um, when they need to for those, you know, more challenging outdoor terrains. Um, we do also offer a, a handful of other types of those adaptive walking aids. Um, there's also another great company out of Canada, Side Sticks, um, that makes some great um, outdoor focused crutches. Um, I think kind of uh, similar questions in mind as we're thinking about trail trail um, amenities um, and that trail signage. So kind of to April's earlier point that like the more sort of objective upfront information that you can provide about the trail and then allow the individual to make their own decision. So things like, you know, incline and cross slope still matter. Um, things like the, you know, the grade and the material still matter and those amenities as well. Um, oftentimes that, you know, the accessible restrooms and parking are still needed um, even with folks using those devices too. April, do you guys rent any of that equipment? Uh, we don't. I know like there's actually a group, that, an individual that uses those side sticks and she hosts her own side stick hike just for individuals that use them. So uh, yes, you know, that definitely um, is an option. And like Tish said, you know, they may choose to, to ambulate, you know, am walk that trail or jump into a piece of adaptive equipment instead. Uh, David has a great question um, asking about any, are there any qualifications to rent a mountain bike? You know, are, are, is there any assessment of their ability to safely operate it? Yes. <laughs> so, um, so that's why we like to host those community bike days and, and one time one off kind of opportunities and it allows us to kind of be able to run a more structured clinic in order to be able to kind of test their skills. I have had individuals rent just from our facility, but we are doing an assessment in the parking lot that they need to demonstrate that they know how to safely stop and steer and control the bike. Um, but obviously at the back of our community center is not out on a trail. Um, so we definitely would prefer that they attend one of our one-off clinics and be able to demonstrate that uh, skill. And then other programs look at more of a lesson model where they want them to have come through an adaptive mountain bike lesson first before then equi renting equipment. So it's kind of up to your organization um, as to how you want to do an orientation to that equipment uh, to ensure that they know how to use that safely. But yes, there is some sort of orientation that takes place. Great. Um, and Elizabeth is asking um, if you're able to share a link to the certification for adaptive mountain biking, I can share that in my follow-up email with attendees. Yeah, well. it's just BICP. Um, and then I believe that there's another organization um, offering adaptive mountain biking, their certification, but BICP is the original one. Um, so. Great. Thank you so much. Um. I think it's PIMBA or uh, professional. I think they just started offering an adaptive as well. Okay. Um, a few people are kind of asking just about the damage from, um, damage may not be the, the right word necessarily, but there's a, a question that Denise had mentioned. My biggest challenge for implementing this as part of our programs um, is the resistance of trail staff. I think it's uh, their concerns are about trail surface impact. You know, this may be more towards the tank uh, tank track type equipment. Do you have any suggestions or thoughts on that? I, I think we have, you know, we all have live by a live, leave no trace and that has a similar, you know, in adaptive mountain biking. So, you know, we want to encourage our adaptive users, just like our regular users, that if it's, you know, recently rained, we're not going to go out on a trail and destroy it. Um, so similar, you know, with our adaptive users. So just providing that education, I, I believe the We've had no experience where the the equipment does any more damage to a trail than any other piece of equipment, um, but I think there's just general education that needs to occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, probably the person asking the question maybe thinking about some of those more tank chair type devices um, that, and, and that's why one of the probably one of the great reasons why there's such a range of different types of equipment, and so maybe that is a piece of equipment that's restricted to a certain particular trail. Um, and there are other types of devices that would be, would have less of an impact on the trail material itself that could be used on trails that are, you know, more sensitive to, to damage or, um, the impact of 
the wheels themselves. Uh, Rose is asking if you could give um, her an estimate of how much you think it would cost for a department to get an equipment rental program started, you know, like equipment wise. Um, so I would start with a good freedom chair because it's the more affordable option. So really our adaptive equipment rental program has definitely taken several years to build. So, you know, we're incorporating each year into our grant writing, either one to two pieces of equipment, depending on kind of the price overall. You know, when you're talking about potentially a $25,000 grant and a bike costs 22,000, that's all of your money gone in one piece of equipment. Um, so really strategizing, um, you know, being able to, if you want you know, I know Truckee Meadows Parks Foundation started with one grit freedom chair, and I believe they're up to three now, and then they're adding an action track chair. Um, so like being able to, you know, maybe start small as far as affordability of equipment. Um, so stuff like the hippocamp breech wheelchair or some of the more affordable pieces of equipment, and then just incorporating that into each year of your funding, either in your, your city budget or in your grant budget, in order to be able to continue to add equipment to your fleet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add that um, typically, like a lot of the parks that we work with, we'll start with maybe one or two pieces of equipment. Um, so like one or two chairs, maybe, you know, if they're getting two, maybe it's because they want to have them in two different locations. And that allows them to kind of, you know, start slow, um, introduce the staff to it, you know, figure out how the, is it going to be a first come first serve or a rental system? And, um, you know, maintenance is very straightforward, but like someone has to be in charge of it. And so how's that going to work? Um, so that like starting small, I think has been um, really wise for most organizations, but, um, you know, one or two pieces, you could be looking at, you know, five to $6,000, um, as a way to get started, um, going a little bit bigger, um, you know, like a Texas state parks that said, okay, we're going to start with five pilot locations. Um, you know, then you're looking at closer to like 15 to $20,000. Great. Uh, Catherine is asking, is there a resource for finding parks um, or systems that offer, you know, rentals or borrowing of adaptive sports equipment? Yes. Um, so unfortunately, like not all centralized in one perfect, easy to access um, system. Um, we have a page on our site that I can share um, where like we know all of the parks and organizations that have grip freedom chairs um, and how they make them available. Uh, Move United also has a great map of all of their member chapters. Um, many of those organizations have some type of equipment. It may not be adaptive, may not be trail equipment. Maybe they focus on basketball or tennis or something, but um, great resource um, to at least be able to connect with whoever is local in your community um, and, and figure out how you can work together. And it's a zip code search too. So that's really lovely that you can just throw in your zip code and see what organizations exist in that area. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, Matthew is asking, are you aware of any universal symbology that is used to indicate adaptive trails? Not that's universally adored. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little, you know, with trail forks trying to do it, there, there's a little bit of stuff with the ATMB level one through three um, that some of um, you might see, but yeah, nothing super consistent. Unfortunately, you know, the ADA really only talks about really brick and mortar spaces um, and it's the access board and other organizations that are putting together standards um, for some of these more unique recreational spaces. Um, so I was going to drop in the chat, Kootenai Adaptive out of BC has done a really great job at trying to kind of create um, some standards. But again, it's nothing that's, you know, locked in like the ADA as far as standards, but, you know, trail access and um, more guidelines that exist. So I'll, I'll make that available as well. Uh, Beth is asking, is there special insurance um, or do they sign <clears throat> or do those using the equipment sign waivers when renting or utilizing the equipment? Um, so obviously I work for a city government, so of course you're signing your life away. Um, so we do have uh, our, our release of liability form, and then there's a contract that exists for the adapt actual equipment rental um, that the individual will sign as well. So, um, and then we do include, you know, the, the nominal fee is to help us be able to do any replacement over time. Um, like I think for a weekend, which is like a Friday to Monday that we do for a rental is like only $55, but that little bit of revenue then helps us continue to be able to maintain that equipment. Um, and then they're, they are signing, you know, if they dam we take a credit card so that if they damage any equipment, we can replace it. Right. 
And we'll do one more question from Wesley. Um, he's in the city of Colorado Springs and they were able to purchase two track chairs through grants, but have been struggling to deploy them. Um, they have limited staff and have not been successful in filling a seasonal program admin position. Do you have any feedback on recruiting for this type of position or maybe feedback in terms of what uh, successful programs have offered in terms of compensation or support for the position? Um, like I would say, not not necessarily for hiring, but maybe looking at organizations that you can partner with as far as deploying. So um, Tish spoke of friends of organizations. Um, so Truckee Meadows Parks Foundation is a friends of organization to City of Reno Parks and Recreation. Um, so we actually have them having the equipment. Um, then it's utilizing their staff and AmeriCorps members to be able to work on the deploy deploying that equipment. Uh, and because they have the nature study area that's staffed all the time, then you can ensure that that equipment is staffed and available to persons with disabilities. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much again. And I know that um, there's many more questions that we're not able to answer because we ran out of time though, but we encourage you to reach out to Tish in April. I'll share their emails again in my follow-up email. Um, and I also, again, want to thank our webinar partners and include Visit Long Beach Peninsula, the Professional Trail Builders Association, iZone Imaging, as well as the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, and the USDA Forest Service. And if you are enjoying these webinars, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. I will do a monthly drawing for those that donate today um, to win our Trail Boss mug, Happy Trails coaster, and stickers. And if you do become a monthly sustaining donor um, or donate $50 or more at one time, we will automatically send you a mug as a thank you. And um, join us for our next webinar uh, taking place in the Advancing uh, Trails webinar series and a reminder to subscribe and support to our YouTube channel at, um, Amer at youtube.com slash American Trails um, to get a notification when we go live every Thursday. So thank you again to everyone for attending.